Welcome and good afternoon and good morning. Uh, we are so delighted that you're joining us today for what promises to be a great deep dive into really important data on whole families in the United States. I'm Sarah Haight. I'm the director of TwoGen Practice at Ascend. I'm speaking to you today from Washington, DC. To just help ground us in our time together, I'd like to acknowledge the history that's brought those of us residing in and around DC to this land. Our Aspen Institute headquarters is in DC's West End neighborhood, which is situated on and adjacent to ancestral lands of the Anacostan, Piscataway, Nanticoke, Pamunkey, and Susquehannock peoples. We have nearly a thousand people who registered for this webinar today, representing nearly all 50 states. So we invite you to look into the indigenous land on which you are working today, and we'll put a link in the chat shortly uh, on a way that you can learn more about the indigenous peoples um, on whose land you're working. So today we'll be sharing insights and top lines from a brand new data brief from Child Trends data on families with low incomes across America can inform two generation approaches. As you see on your screen, um, a couple of quick housekeeping, housekeeping notes. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be made available on our website where the report is already live following the webinar. We're also going to ensure some time for Q&A. You can put your questions in the Q&A box. You can put them in throughout the webinar and we'll be tracking those. Please note if we do not get to your question, we will review all questions with our speakers and post responses to our website next week, because we know that synthesizing this data for your work is important. So on the next screen, you'll see we have a terrific lineup of speakers, Marta Alvira Hammond from Child Trends, Marjorie Sims from Ascend, and Ascend fellow Michelle Sarche from the Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Health at the Colorado School of Public Health. We want to say a special thank you to Lizzie Wildsmith, who has led this data analysis with Marta from Child Trends, but is unable to join us for this webinar. I'm going to introduce Ann Mosley in just a moment, but before we dive into the data itself, we want to provide just some brief context on Ascend's partnership with Child Trends and the importance of these approaches to support whole families. So in 2011, Ascend embarked on our partnership with Child Trends, and we commissioned a comprehensive analysis of the census data across family structure, education, economic status, and race and ethnicity. This was actually a first of its kind two gen analysis of the census, and it's available on our website, as well as highlights are in our 2012 report, Two Generations, One Future. Since then, our qualitative and quantitative analyses of family data trends and insights have emerged through dozens of focus groups, listening sessions, uh, a portfolio of bipartisan polling, and the report we are sharing today. Always, we keep parent and family voices at the center, prioritizing a racial equity and gender lens and an inclusive frame on family structures. Importantly, today you'll hear not just about the findings of an analysis of most re recent census, but also a comparative analysis of that work we did nearly a, or a little over a decade ago. So with that, I'm now very pleased to introduce Ann Mosley. She is the vice president at the Aspen Institute and founder and executive director of Ascend at the Aspen Institute. And Ann's gonna share some insights on um, Ascend's work, the two generation approach and some top lines that all of you can use in your own work. Ann? Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and it's a pleasure uh, to be with you all today. And we are thrilled by the strong response from both longstanding partners and so many new colleagues who share our passion for really driving intergenerational family prosperity and well being and believe in the power of the two gen approach. Um, thank you, Sarah Haight, for your leadership on this important work and important partnership with Child Trends who, as Sarah said, has been a longstanding and important partner for us as we look at qualitative, quantitative, and ensuring that families are at the table for policy practice uh, and research, co-design, co-creation, and also decision-making to make sure their voices of solutions are coming forward to the table. On child trends, there's so many other friends to um, sort of highlight, but I did want to say uh, a note of appreciation and thanks for the leadership of Dina around him, who is a Ascend uh, fellow and also a leading scholar and researcher on the child trends team in the area of research and understanding the cultural and community context and culture for American Indian and Alaskan Native 
uh, tribal families and their communities and tribal sovereignty. I also wanna say thank you and a little shout out to Lena Guzman, who is the chief strategy officer and also directs Child Trends Hispanic Institute. And of course, Carol Emig, the president who has been alongside us from our early days. For some of you who are new friends and old friends, Ascend has been working to catalyze with partners in the field, a modern two generation approach. One that intentionally focuses on children and the adults in their lives together. We believe in honoring lived experience. We embrace racial, gender, and economic equity through a lens of intersectionality. We are a community of leaders that are well-connected, prepared, and positioned to make the transformational change that we need. Our hearts, our minds, our policies and practices, and today's we're going to do a deep dive on the research to strengthen our shared knowledge base from where we are. We always say at Ascend, the two-generation approach is not a new approach. It is not one that... Uh, that we created it comes from indigenous longstanding wisdom, evident in work from the settlement house movement up through critical partnerships and, and policy efforts from Head Start to early work from foundation from the Foundation for Child Development and many, many others. For Ascend, we also believe in the power of co-creation for greater collective impact. Our Ascend community is not just the amazing Ascenders on the team here, but also includes 130 diverse parent advisors who help guide and shape our work, and we learn with and from them every day. It also encompasses our 120 Ascend Fellows who are on the drivers of change, whether it's entering new seats of position and opportunity from the U.S. Senate, the Maryland Governor's Office, to local positions, to also transforming state and local policies and practices. We also have a strong Ascend national network of nearly 500 organizations that share a commitment to racial, gender, and economic equity and are grounded in a two-generation approach. Active in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and growing internationally from Ireland, Rwanda, and Guatemala. Together, we are reaching more than 12 million families and also changing the context and the policies and the practices to strengthen their lives so they are able to achieve their full dreams. Ascend has, next slide please, Lexi. Ascend has a certain point of view around what really drives equitable, effective policy and systems change. And I share this because we have a formula really of following, listening first to those that are the expert of their lives, the parents, the caregivers, their families. Then it's about the data, the research, the science, the evidence, which we'll be taking a deep dive with Marta and the Child Trends team in just a moment. And then connecting that with best and promising practices. That combined with leadership and political will really informs what is possible to drive policy and systems change that is equitable, that is effective, that is pragmatic, and allows for full family well-being. Now, as we get ready to go into the research, I want to share just three takeaways and highlights that stand out. And of course, Marta will give us a great deep dive in but a moment. And while sometimes it can feel like it's challenging out there, we embrace a mindset of abundance and also ambition. And I think it's important to note that we have seen progress. And while this is a snapshot from 2011 to 2021, we saw a drop from 36% of families with households that are low income in 2011 be reduced to now 29%. Now we know that this period of the past few years with the pandemic and with the demand and call for overdue racial justice um, and economic justice for families, we know that we've seen some really important policy and practice moves and innovations that have happened. And on the policy level, I would just call out two, because I think they're important to keep in mind, is where we saw pandemic investments, especially, for example, around healthcare and healthcare access, with the increased access to and use of CHIP and Medicaid, that we saw record highs of 92% of people in the U.S. covered with healthcare. This is especially critical for children and families at the youngest years to have quality, continuous healthcare coverage. We know that we're entering a phase right now where states 
and communities are going to be facing disenrollment. This is an opportunity for to keep that in the back of the mind as we take in this important data, the importance of how we use and apply and focus on key federal levers and commitments like Medicaid, like CHIP. Second piece, when we think about the progress and we celebrate that progress, I think it's also important from just looking at Q4 of 2022, the impacts that we're continuing to see compounded by inflation and also interest. At the end of 2022, we saw record high spikes topping, almost reaching $1 trillion of credit card debt. We know that inflation impacts families with low incomes. It multiplier effects compared to folks on the other ends of the economic ladder, transforming the conversation around milk, gas, ability to pay rent into an everyday tension that affects family and children's well-being. The second piece that I would raise is we also, and we have known this, we've been tracking this, but we are seeing exciting shifts in the diversity and the demographics of our families. We'll hear more, but one of the headlines is there is not a dominant family structure right now. We at Ascend believe families are defined by how they define them, by how they define themselves. And I think there's a, we're at a generational moment of opportunity that really calls us and requires us to have a much more modern, inclusive, and equitable mindset. And the mental models that we bring to our policy development and implementation, our practices and our services, we really have to lean into understanding the diversity of our families. Old frameworks like minority and majority no longer make any sense as we know the majority of children up to age 15 are children of color. It is no longer a non-Hispanic white world of what we're looking at when we're thinking about our children and our families and whether it's 2045 or other estimates, our country is truly a diverse and pluralistic society and what an opportunity that is for us. Third piece is when we look at that diversity of families and structures, the one thing we do know is the power of a two-generation approach to bring that perspective to how we work and serve and see families wholly. We see the whole family, the child and the adults in their lives, whether that's a multi-generation household, whether that's a one or two um, different family structure. But if we know that one of the most important indicators of a child's immediate short-term success and long-term is their parent or adult in their lives, their health, their economic, and their educational status. And as any, as we all know as parents and as members of communities, we all want the best for our children. And as parents, we know that we're only as happy as our least happy child. There'll be a lot more data to bring that to life, but when we think about the kind of practice and policy innovations that look at the well-being and the economic and the educational and the health and well-being success of children and families, we know that we really need to be looking at children and the adults in their lives together. So with no further ado, I am eager, just like all of you, to do a deep dive, jump into the pool with Marta to go into the data. So again, Marta and to the entire team at Child Trends, I thank you for your important work and let's get into the data. Thank you. Great, thanks, Anne. Uh, so as we've just heard, efforts to support families uh, need data and uses of data to shine light on families and their lives. So informed by all of this, this report provides a high level data snapshot of many of the US families who may be eligible for and benefit from 2Gen supports uh, and services. For this report, we use multiple data sources for our analyses, including uh, national data from the Census Bureau, we first described levels of household poverty and low income status between 2011 and 2021 among families with children. Uh, with the 2021 data, we then look more closely at some key characteristics of families and households uh, with low incomes, families with children. We provide a snapshot of these families overall, but also separately uh, for specific family types, uh, families headed by a single parent, families with young children, uh, kids under five, families with younger parents, families in multi-generational households. Um, these are groups that often face additional strains and uh, maybe uh, priority populations for uh, anti-poverty efforts. Importantly though, these are not mutually exclusive family types. So many families may be in more than one of those categories. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, 
we bring in some county level data to examine some select uh, dimensions of community health in the counties where these families live. Uh, of course, we can't review every finding in full detail uh, in the time that we have, especially the more detailed findings uh, across those select uh, specific family types. So we encourage you to read the report that's available both on the Child Trans and uh, SENS website. Uh, next slide. So first, uh, I'll provide a bit of context for how American families are changing and have changed substantially over the past decades. Uh, and there are some differences across groups that these, that these changes are also uh, relatively widespread. So although most people still aspire to marriage, marriages are happening a good deal later in life than they used to. So the figure on the left uh, from the census shows a median age at first marriage for men and women, closer to, to 28 for women, uh, almost 30 for men. You can see how that's gone up over time. Five decades ago, people began their adult lives with marriage, um, frequently moving in together, building a career, managing a household, having kids, often were considered milestones that came after that. Today, if and when a legal marriage does happen, it's more likely to happen when couples feel more economically secure already, often after some of, of those other life events have already happened. Cohabitation, uh, so living with a partner, a romantic partner without being married has also increased over this time period. We know from other recent uh, data that about three quarters of marriages now began as a cohabiting union. We've also seen shifts in childbearing. So the age people start having babies has gone up, uh, getting to a little over 27 for women, slightly higher for men. This shift also corresponds with large declines in births among teenagers, also declines in births to people in their 20s. Uh, and so in this report, families with young parents, as we, as we refer to them, are those with a parent under 28, since we know they've already begun having children uh, below that average age. Also about 40% of births occur to unmarried parents. Um, however, as you can see in the, the figure on the right, and something that's good to, to keep in mind, uh, anytime you see stats or, or reporting on on births and, and marriage, that today, births to unmarried parents can include a few different things. It doesn't automatically mean uh, unpartnered entirely. You can see that over half of these unmarried births in 2019 were to cohabiting couples, about 22% uh, of the total births. And so about 85% of those babies born, uh, they were born to, with both parents in the household, either married or cohabiting. Next slide. All right, and so against that backdrop, I'll start. I'll review some of our findings, starting with the 2011 and 2021 trends. Uh, so, looking at household poverty and low income status for families uh, here for this report, families, uh, as I, as we'll be referring to them throughout, are those where we have at least one parent with at least one of their own children uh, under the age of 18 living in the household together. Both of these figures. For each pair of bars, the bar on the left is 2011, bar on the right is 2021. So overall, you can see drops both in the poverty and in low income status in this time period. Overall, uh, for families, a uh, drop of about five percentage points, 16% uh, of families were uh, in, had household incomes below the poverty threshold in 2011 um, versus about 11% in 2021. Percentage of families in low-income households also declined uh, about 36% in 2011 to 29% in 2021. Uh, and, and you can see these family, these declines across family types here. Still, in 2021, uh, families with single parents and those with younger parents do stand out, uh, but in both, in both poverty and low income. Next slide. And so I want to zoom in uh, briefly on the single parent families. So blue bars are headed by single mothers. Red bars represent families with single fathers. And what I want to point out here is that even with these, these declines over the time period, we still have substantial gender gaps uh, between families headed by single moms versus single dads. In 2021, about twice as many uh, families headed by a single mom were in households classified as in poverty compared to father-headed families, uh, and more than half, about 55% of families with a single mother lived in households with low income versus about a third of those with a single father. Next slide. 
All right, so focusing on the data from 2021, um, and for families and households with low income, they are diverse. So first, uh, in this report, white non-Hispanic families are about a third of the families, so underrepresented relative to the population, about a third are Hispanic uh, parents, about a fifth uh, were Black non-Hispanic parents, so overrepresented um, additional groups, including uh, Native uh, parents, American Indian, Alaska Native, Asian, uh, other groups have smaller sample size, which uh, in the full report we detail more, and I will come back to uh, that later. But families are also diverse in family structure and living arrangements. So uh, for these families overall, almost half were headed by a single parent uh, and just over half were with two parent families. So uh, about 43% married, 8% cohabiting. Uh, the remaining bars show some of the other family types. So a few things to pull out here, about three quarters of the families in multi-generational households were uh, with low income were also single parent families. Uh, among young uh, families with young children, we do see a larger share, about 60% with married or cohabiting parents. Cohabitation, not too unusual, particularly uh, for the families with younger children and those with younger parents. Uh, also noting that among those single parent families, most, the majority, about 87%, uh, have a single mother. So important context for thinking about the gender gaps in poverty and low income uh, just described. Next slide. Uh, so who do these families live with? Overall, most of the families and households with low income lived on their own. So parents and kids, not anyone else living in the household with them, but about 12% lived with a grandparent. Uh, so essentially a multi-generational household. Uh, living in a multi-generational household is close to one in five uh, sing families with single parents and similar a little over one in five for those with younger parents. Now, we know from, from other research that many single parent families with low incomes uh, are living in a multi-generational household primarily to care for an adult. So while living with a grandparent sometimes can mean having an extra adult to help with childcare and household needs, it can also add uh, to parents' caregiving responsibilities and stressors. Next slide. Now, having lower income of course can be an economic barrier all on its own, but we also see that these families face additional challenges in many of the important pathways to economic stability and mobility. As a home ownership, an important part of wealth building in the United States, most of um, these families in households with low income, about 60% lived in rented housing rather than owned. Uh, families with younger parents, uh, higher about 76%. The families in multi-generational households uh, were more likely to live in owned homes, about 53%. Uh, of course, in some of, or many of those cases, uh, it may be grandparents who own that home as well. Next slide. Okay, so we look at the highest level of, of education for the most educated parent in the family. Uh, education, of course, another uh, important pathway to economic security and mobility. For more than half of the families, uh, the highest level of education completed was a high school diploma or less, about 17%. The highest level was uh, less than high school. About 70% also had a parent who had completed a bachelor's degree or more. Next slide. <laughs> right, so here we show percentages of families uh, with uh, low income households with at least one parent who reported being currently employed uh, at all in the dark blue bars and uh, full-time in the medium lighter blue bars. So about 71% of families had at least one employed parent, about half reported working full-time. Uh, the data also has information on if they worked during the previous year and if not, why not? And responses uh, to those questions are also telling of families competing demands. Among the families <clears throat> who didn't work in the past year, uh, about one in five, almost one in five, about 18% said they didn't work due to an illness or disability. Uh, that was a little higher uh, among families with a single parent, <clears throat> about 27%. And then about two thirds of those who hadn't worked in the previous year, uh, they said they didn't work in order to care for the home or, or a family member. Next slide. 
Marta, this is Sarah. I'm just jumping in because there's a couple questions that I think can be answered quickly. Can you briefly okay. answer how you are defining low-income household or household with low income? Oh, yes. Uh, so whereas poverty is uh, families below the official poverty threshold, um, according to uh, census official poverty thresholds, low income uh, in this report is twice that. So two times or 200% of uh, that poverty threshold, uh, which is a, uh, people use different thresholds, but 200% but is one that is commonly used uh, to determine financial eligibility for various uh, programs. Okay, uh, all right, so bringing us to health. So economic hardship and lack of access to services can create and exacerbate health problems. And then of course, health problems can limit one's ability to meet family needs, maintain a stable income. Services may not always provide enough assistance, uh, even where work is possible. A lot of workplaces are not that accessible or accommodating to illness or disability. And additionally, healthcare costs in the United States are, are quite high, much higher than many other uh, wealthy countries. So among these families uh, and households with low income, about 17% had at least one parent reporting only fair or poor health. And about one in five of the families reported that no parent had health insurance coverage. Of course, the pandemic, uh, thinking about this and the context has disproportionately affected people with lower incomes, in addition to job safety and security disparities in infection and deaths from COVID-19, but it also now long-term impacts that are still unfolding, but we see disparities in long COVID symptoms still affecting people's daily lives as well. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> All right, so the final part of this analysis looked at health of communities at the county level where families with low incomes live relative to other families where we live can shape our access to social and economic resources. Uh, in addition to the presence of you know, general health and, and safety factors. One note here, since we are, are using county data, the sample of families here have to have identifiable county, uh, county information and those that do tend to be more urban and suburban compared to the population overall. Uh, that said, still those families uh, with lower incomes tend to live in counties with <clears throat> slightly worse scores across several community health indicators that we have examined. Uh, you can see the, the full list of, of measures that we looked at in the report, uh, but a bit worse on measures like child poverty rates, violent crime, air quality or air, air pollution specifically, um, severe housing problems, access to healthy food. Uh, these families also lived in counties with slightly higher childcare cost burdens relative to other families, uh, meaning counties where in general, a higher proportion of household income was going to childcare. Next slide. All right, so to summarize uh, and offer some, some closing thoughts. So we see declines in household poverty and low income status among families over 10 years, uh, but we do know, uh, and as Anne mentioned, uh, that in addition to rising cost of living, inflation, widening in, uh, economic inequality, soaring student loan debt, many other strains. The pandemic has worsened uh, economic hardship for many families since 2020, not to mention the health and safety burden. Uh, some of the federal initiatives uh, and, and listed several of them, but they did help lift a lot of families out of poverty during this time. Um, but many of those pandemic related supports have since expired, uh, including expanded SNAP uh, or food assistance benefits, which expired, I believe yesterday. Uh, many families have circumstances. So in this context, many families have other circumstances, additional circumstances that can make economic stability and mobility more challenging. Those challenges may be more pronounced for certain family types like those highlighted in the report. Um, but of course, many of those people in those family types that we've highlighted here may also be in uh, other historically and presently oppressed groups and all the ways that these characteristics and identities intersect mean both compounded and unique forms of discrimination, marginalization, impeding well-being and economic mobility and stability. Uh, and one important point 
because this is something that we've seen in our other work as well, and, and many people joining may, may encounter this too or, or know it very well personally, that many, many families with low income do have a working parent in a household. They may have more than one. They may be working full time. There's often a narrative about getting into the labor force and getting a job, but simply having a job often isn't the issue and doesn't automatically create the opportunity for economic mobility. The characteristics of jobs matter. <laughs> and uh, low wages may cause low income, but uh, those jobs, which uh, families with low incomes are overrepresented in these jobs that also often have irregular and inflexible schedules, less security, less access to benefits that are essential for uh, supporting families like health insurance and paid leave. Efforts like two-gen approaches can help expand reach and effectiveness of services designed to support families uh, at those multiple points and considering the how intertwined the kids and their parents are. For example, you know, workforce supports that can provide resources, not just for employment, but to help families with childcare needs that arise from working. Um, Many families still don't have support though to meet their basic needs, let alone to help them thrive. Structural barriers, systemic barriers can and do uh, disproportionately exclude many families from receiving supports, being eligible for supports, often resulting from practices and policies embedded in the systems that are providing those services. Uh, processes can be really difficult, confusing to navigate or keep up with, and that can make it really difficult even when families may on paper be eligible and technically be able to receive support to be able to have consistent and reliable support. So for the field, it's also important to make sure that efforts focus not just on managing life with these barriers, but on identifying and removing and working to remove the barriers that are imposed on so many families. Okay, and then finally, some data considerations as researchers, policymakers, practitioners, many of you joining today, continue to build out two gen supports for families and other work on, uh, with families. Data can help us understand what families look like, what their lives are like, what their needs may be, strengths that can be leveraged to help them thrive. But getting comprehensive data on families. Uh, especially on a larger scale, is very challenging. It's resource intensive, uh, especially when you want more detailed data. There's often a trade-off between the level of detail and you know, the sample size and how representative estimates can be. So we often have to use data from multiple sources to get a fuller picture. This is true for any population, um, but especially for some of the most under-resourced populations, uh, including, for example, Black and Hispanic families, uh, American Indian and Alaska Native families, immigrant families, families in rural areas, many other groups. Even with many of our larger data sources, we often don't have enough cases for some of these groups to provide good estimates, which perpetuates their exclusion and then can keep us behind in understanding their circumstances or needs. So it's important to be very intentional and work to get information on these populations. There are some methods that do attempt to overcome some of these challenges, but we need to continue to prioritize that. And it's also important just for us to keep in mind as we do our work to support families, because it's hard to meet, to help families meet their needs if we don't have a good understanding of what they look like, what their lives are like, what they actually need. Even for this high level data snapshot, you know, we're using multiple data sources. So it's important to be pulling and being innov be innovative in uh, trying to get information that family that will help meet families' needs. Uh, so with that, um, thank you. And this last slide has our uh, email addresses for uh, Lizzie Wildsmith and I in case anyone wants to contact us. And I will turn it back to Anne. Marta, thank you so much for that uh, in-depth uh, presentation, and I really appreciate your last slide, especially around the considerations, um, because I think um, we intentionally wanted to bring in some further context of understanding the data and the opportunity from the context culture of the worlds and the systems that families are living within that have not kept up with the times and their realities and also their strengths. And the, when we think about our work at Ascend, always been based on understanding that our systems are outdated, fragmented, 
and inequitable in many ways, um, intentionally and explicitly, and sometimes, you know, unintentionally. However, our generational opportunity is to really challenge our mindset and our mental model and not and to look at new ways of even how we capture data, the stories. And so it's not just what we hear, it's also how we do it. And my colleague, Marjorie Sims, who is a field leader beloved by all, has been on the Ascend team, really the lead holder and architect in many ways around um, creating an outcomes framework that is growing and being co-created and formed by and with the field um, through her work with the two generation building evidence evidence, learning in action community. And as we know, we have an active uh, conversation about what is evidence? What is evidence informed? And so Marjorie is going to be sharing some insights from that work in relation to what you've just heard. And then Michelle Starche will follow her, who is a clinical psychologist and associate pre um, professor for the Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Health and the Department of Community and Behavior Health at the Colorado School of Public Health. Um, but she has also been a leading researcher and scholar to be going into communities and culture and also bringing in indigenous expertise and wisdom to not only what we're learning about uh, native and tribal um, children and families, but also how we actually do research. So Marjorie, thank you so much for sharing your insights. And after you, if um, you can just invite Michelle to join, that'd be lovely. Sorry about that. I didn't realize I was muted. Um, thanks so much, Anne. And I would just like to add a little bit more texture to why this data is important to two generation practitioners and policymakers. As Marta has shared, family structures are very diverse in our country. There isn't one dominant family structure. The two generation approach centers on supporting the whole family as defined by the family right? Defined by the family. This means that we as practitioners and policymakers need to ask families how they define themselves and open opportunities so that the entire family thrives. And we must be tracking outcomes for children and parents to ensure their that our programs and policies across the core domains, as Marta noted, are expanding family prosperity across generations. For close to a decade, Ascend has developed tools and resources to deepen learning and evaluation within community organizations and state systems. And we'll share um, with you links to those three publications that we've developed that detailed outcomes frameworks when implementing two generation approaches. Our most recent effort, as Anne mentioned, is this effort to deepen learning, evaluation, and research um, across the field, and that is called the Two Generation Building Evidence Learning in Action Community, which is supported by the Conrad Hilton Foundation. This dynamic community of 45 includes seven parent advisors, five funders, 17 researchers, and 12 community-based organizations. And we also have federal staff from the Administration for Children and Families Office of Planning, Research and Evaluation as part of our group. Our goal is to develop a comprehensive set of learning, evaluation, and research questions for the two-generation field that will guide our collective work going forward over the next five years. So for the last nine months, we have listened to the experiences and recommendations of parents. We have gone deep, you know, into what it means to develop a set of principles when conducting evaluation um, and research with families and communities. Importantly, we have had rich, rich conversations, as Anne mentioned, about defining evidence and being deeply moved when one of our parent advisors shared we are the evidence and implored that we all work collaboratively with families. We release um, this work in a couple of months and we look forward to your feedback. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Michelle Sarce, our Ascend Fellow to share her remarks. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Anne shared, my name and, and Marjorie, my name is Michelle Sarche, and I'm on the faculty at the University of Colorado 
Anschutz Medical Campus and Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Health. I'm here in Denver, Colorado on Cheyenne, Arapaho and Ute territory and in a thriving urban native community now home to indigenous people from tribes across the country. I'm also a member of the Building Evidence Learning and Action Committee that Marjorie just described and an Ascend Fellow in the, from the 2018 cohort. It's my pleasure to join you all today to share some considerations for Native American communities. In my brief five minutes, I'm gonna to touch on three things. The importance of the six components that you see on the screen here of a two-gen approach to family prosperity and well-being that Anne reviewed. Um, the importance of those six components for Native American communities. Um, what I would propose um, be the addition of additional relevant gears to drive those components in Native American communities. And then very, very briefly, four data efforts that are helping move research and evaluation forward in support of two-gen practice uh, systems and policy in Native communities. Um, I had a chance to skim the registrant list for today, and I see that some of my colleagues from those four projects are here today. So a special shout out to all of you. Um, so these six components of a two-gen approach to building family prosperity and well-being are really critical priorities for Native American communities. Um, you don't have to look too far into the available data to see that children and families in Native communities experience significant disparities in each of these areas. They experience higher rates of poverty, less access to early care and education, lower high school graduation rates, lower rates of college attendance and graduation, greater unemployment, and higher rates of a number of physical and mental health conditions. And as long as these disparities continue, prosperity and well being will remain out of reach for many Native American families. For Native families, the disparities we see today have been driven by colonization and historically traumatic policies and practices that separated children from their families, families from their communities, and communities from their land, disrupting the kinds of culturally protective factors that can support family prosperity and well being, and depriving Native communities of the most fundamental conditions for prosperity and well being. Um, and to understand um, this, for tribal communities, it's important to know that things weren't always this way. Um, the United States ongoing failure to uphold its treaty obligations to native nations further contribute to these disparities. According to the federal government's own reports, funding to support the healthcare, education, housing, and other forms of quote, proper care and protection that were promised to native Americans in exchange for stolen or surrendered land and resources has fallen woefully short. Next slide, please. So as we think about the key components of a two-gen approach to building family prosperity and well-being for Native American families, yes, we must reduce disparities and promote flourishing in each of the six domains listed here. However, we must also honor tribal sovereignty and recognize Native American culture and language as the foundational drivers of these efforts. Native American communities have always known what their children and families need and are really leading the way forward to design and implement not just two gen, but multi gen practices, systems, and policies in early care, education, and home visiting, and are building innovative partnerships with tribal colleges and universities to train the workforce to deliver these services. Next slide, please. Um, as shared earlier, we need to be intentional to get data on key populations who face disproportionate and unique barriers to economic stability. And to this end, um, research and evaluation practices are evolving to support two gen efforts that promote prosperity and well being in Native American communities. And I'm just going to share very briefly here um, four efforts. Um, um, that I have either been directly involved with or um, friends and colleagues um, are leading. And so uh, the one um, just going from left to right that I want to highlight, um, the first one is the Tribal Early Childhood Research Center. And we're really happy um, to be partnering with uh, Child Trends as one of our uh, research partners on that effort. 
and the, the TRC. And when you see the slides that will be listed on the uh, available on the Aspen website uh, following today's webinar, um, those are hyperlinks to all of these projects. And um, there's ways to get involved and uh, to learn more about all of the exciting work happening in research and evaluation supporting 2Gen in Native communities. But among the things that the Tribal Early Childhood Research Center is doing is really responding to the need for measures that align with the lived experiences of children and families in Native communities so that the research and the data and the narratives that we construct with those data that we could, could uh, collect again, really are authentic and tell the story um, of Native uh, children and families. Um, the next one that I wanted to highlight, um, this is not a project that I'm involved with, but colleagues at the Brazelton Touchpoint Center and the First Light Education Foundation. It's the Indigenous Early Learning Collaborative. And if you have a chance, I highly encourage you to go to that website and watch the video that they created that is really supporting deeply community-based um, and driven uh, inquiry in uh, early care and education and two gen efforts ha happening in indigenous communities um, in the US. Um, so really encourage you to go there and, and watch their video. Um, there's a, a need for data that is deeply grounded in specific indigenous communities and ways of knowing and being. And so that is an example of some of those efforts that are happening now. And then, um, you know, complementary to very uh, community uh, grounded and specific research and evaluation efforts is the need for national data on uh, tribal children and families. And I was really honored to be a part of the American Indian and Alaska Native Head Start Family and Child Experiences Survey, which is a national study of um, the tribally run Head Start programs in what's called Region 11. Um, so that study was designed in partnership with researchers as well as um, uh, tribal Head Start program partners to ensure that it was designed in a way that put the needs of those tribal programs uh, front and center, um, but also could be used to tell that national story and provide um, those critically important national level data to inform policy and practice in early care and education. And then the last that I wanted to highlight, um, there's nobody better to do research and evaluation with and for uh, tribal communities than indigenous people themselves. And so um, there are very few um, researchers uh, who are themselves indigenous. And so uh, I'm involved with the Native Children's Research Exchange Scholars Program. Again, you can link on that there uh, to learn about what we're doing to really grow that workforce of indigenous scholars who can lead the way forward in uh, research and evaluation that supports children and families in tribal communities. Um, and I think that covers everything that I, I wanted to share. Thank you so much, Marta and Michelle, Marjorie and Anne. So we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. There's been a robust discussion in the Q&A chat already. You'll see that different ascenders and Marta have been responding to specific questions in the chat. But I'm going to synthesize a few questions, first going to Marta, given um, the number of questions related to the data itself, and then go to a, a couple of ascenders. Um, so my fellow panelists are welcome to, to put themselves put their, their selves instead of their pictures back up uh, for everyone. Um, and just want to reiterate that the PowerPoint and the recording for this webinar will be on our website. I know there's a number of questions about that. And the report itself is on our website. There's quite a bit more data and nuance in the report itself. We are trying to capture the top lines here. So just want to reiterate that. The first question that I have for, for Marta is an amalgam of a few questions that have come in, which is really around how have um, pandemic era supports impacted what we're seeing as a sort of silver lining in terms of the poverty rate right now? We know, for example, that the child tax credit lowered child poverty rates. Can you just speak to how you considered some of the pandemic era supports in this analysis? Yeah, so the, the main data that we are using for most of these analyses are from the current population survey um, from the Census and Bureau of Labor Statistics, and uh, mostly from 2021. So collected sort of, you know, a year into the pandemic, in some cases reporting on the previous year, so which would be the first full year of the pandemic, 
you know, in 2020, a lot of those supports had not happened yet. Um, there are, you know, lots of discussions as to looking at something pre-pandemic now often seems like, well, what does that mean? What can we even take from that? Because so much has changed and many things will stay changed. Um, in this data, we don't specifically have a lot of questions about pandemic supports. Uh, there are other data sources. So the Household Pulse Survey, for example, also from the Census Bureau has been providing a lot of that. Um, you know, speaking of just pulling from multiple data sources, you also you often have to look at multiple places. Um, I've done some work with the Pulse data on housing, right? Because that was a huge stressor up and down throughout the pandemic where, you know, eviction moratoria, we had eviction moratoria that then they would, it was about to expire and then they would extend it. And then it was about to expire and then they would extend it. And it was good, but then families are still living in this position of constantly every few months, not knowing, you know, if that will be expanded. So we don't have really detailed information in this data. We know some stuff from, from other things. We know that these supports did help a lot of families. Many of them are ending, um, which we will see effects of that. I think in some cases we already have. Um, yeah, that's about what we have here. I could talk more, I'm sure, but uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Marta. And I would just note too that um, the report explores um, the, the ways in which families have intersected with um, the education system alongside their economic status, early childhood, social connectedness, some elements of issues around transportation. Um, so it's important to just note that we try and got go we tried to go under the hood um, with child trends on those core components of the two generation approach that you saw Anne speak to um, at the top. Um, and we'll include um, some links to the resources that Marta has shared in her responses. So you can see that um, alongside the report when we put um, the QA on the website. Um, the next question I want to um, actually direct Anne to you, um, and this is on how Ascend works with or engages with families that are not zero to five or super young children. Can you speak to that briefly? Thanks so much, Sarah. And that was a great question. Um, when we step up and we look at families, the importance of the two generation approach is really to put the child and the outcome like, and the adults in their lives at the center. And that kind of goes between the world of sort of population health, big change piece, and then um, in levels of attention, I will see so many programs, services, funding go in a fragmented way, early childhood, but then post-secondary pathways or health over here. And so literally that mindset and the six core components, and I love the tribal sovereignty, beautiful gear, that cross cuts for children and the adults in their lives across family structures at different ages. We're also seeing some interesting innovations that are for uh, some new work for, from in, um, in Toledo, Ohio. Chicago Hope has been doing, Hope Chicago has been doing some of this work both in Toledo, Ohio, and now in Chicago and some other places. But to look at both um, high school seniors and their parents, for example, but bringing that two-generation approach. It is a way of kind of thinking about one's work, one place in the ecosystem that is truly family-centered and thinking about how those components come together in any of our lives or in any of our families that can cut across the economics or the geographics or also um, or other parts of identity. It's what all families need um, but the access to that, the equity of that, the resource nature of that is not equitable and also not always culturally responsive, resonant, or appropriate. Thanks, Anne. Um, and there are a couple of questions in the chat about specific data points in the report. Um, and if Marta is not able to answer those in the chat, we'll make sure to post them. 
Um, I wanted to uh, just uh, get to Trisha Reynolds' question around any insights or resources on how this data or this work overall integrates with the justice system, as she notes, the correctional system. Um, Michelle, would love to go to you with this just to see if there's anything um, that, that you'd like to share specifically around two-gen approaches and or um, the work you're doing, which I know has been really childhood focused and thinking about the justice involved population. Um, I, I, I don't work in that space, um, but I mean, I think that the early childhood work that we're doing in tribal communities, and when I say we, I mean, uh, collectively, the many uh, research and program partners in tribal communities across the country, the work that we're doing in early childhood is, you know, really grounded in indigenous ways of knowing and being and indigenous concepts for what it means to be a healthy, healthy and thriving individual and how uh, parents and communities can support that for children and families. And so I think um, that work is really um, revitalizing uh, for tribal communities and really a source of strength that I think sets um, children on a you know, really strong path um, throughout the life course. So. Thank you. And I would just, um, Iman Moore asked a question about easily accessible resources for Head Starts or for colleges working with parents. And Michelle, know that you've done a lot of thinking about early Head Start and Head Start. Um, and on our website, we have some resources, um, both for community colleges and post-secondary institutions seeking to partner more effectively with early childhood. Um, but Michelle, any any resources on Head Start or Early Head Start from a two gen standpoint you you want to note now? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I would check out our Tribal Early Childhood Research Center and all of the things that we're doing, not just in measurement, but around education and um, uh, some conferences that we host and training opportunities. Um, but also to check out the American Indian Alaska Native Head, Head Start Family and Child Experiences Survey data. Um, those data are really unique and, again, nationally representative of, of you know, children and families served by uh, tribally run Head Start programs. But I would love to connect with anybody um, who has a specific interest in doing early childhood work in uh, tribal communities in the United States. There's a lot happening in home visiting, Head Start, child care, et cetera. Thank you, Michelle. And we'll include um, in the um, posting on our site some resources from um, a few of our fellows in this area, as well as um, insights from the post-secondary success for parents initiative at Ascend. Um, in the last minute, I want to turn it back over to Anne to answer a question on the promising avenues of economic mobility, especially pioneered by Ascend fellows. Um, so Anne, I know you wanted to respond to that before we close out. Uh, thanks so much, Sarah. And again, thank you to everybody. There's such rich questions and, and just um, very intentional leaders and organizations and partners in this conversation today. So I just really want to acknowledge that. We're not going to do uh, justice to it all, but a few headlines I would raise up for, um, for the group. Through the fellows, we've really tried to target what are kind of leaders that represent the full diversity, genius, and brilliance of um, across our country and across all sectors and disciplines. And so a few themes that we're seeing some very um, intentional promising action, one in the public sector, when we think about the anchor role of state and county level health and human services agencies to bring a two-generation approach when we think about their work, whether it's from childcare, early learning, quality ratings, certain, um, efforts like resource and referrals, and then food assistant, workforce, housing, how to bring a two-generation approach that can bring families at the center within the agency and that on that billion dollar level in many states, both within that agency, across agencies, and then how they partner with uh, the partners in the nonprofit and service community to do that and also with families in new ways. Along those lines, we're also seeing, um, we are deeply committed to lived experience and expertise, not just being heard and listened to, but being at the table of decision-making, co-creation, and in the leadership pipeline, and are looking at new instruments with um, deeper intention around family councils, paid compensation at the level that is appropriate for expertise, 
Um, when we think about what we can also learn from tribes and native families that have always had a very intersectional and integrated approach and with sovereignty, more flexibility, also creating more cross learning when we think about kind of governance structures. That's one exciting area. We're also excited that we have two fellows, Rashida Brown and Tanja Rucker, respectfully, respectfully, respectively, one um, a leader with the um, National Association of Counties, other with the National League of Cities, because part of Ascend, just like in the two generation approach, it's not one organization, it's not one component. We're building networks of networks to build this in. So as we think about the 5,000 plus counties, the multiplicity and diversity of cities, how are we building and growing across? And the last two pieces I'll just share for the question around criminal justice um, or uh, and criminal injustice in many ways in those families that are touched. Fellows such as Ebony Underwood, who is uh, leading a very powerful organization, We Got Us Now, um, is really raising visibility, new practices and policies from higher ed law schools and also with hospitals as a daughter who had uh, experienced um, incarceration, how to think about the children who have families that have been incarcerated or trust, um, touched by the criminal injustice system in ways that um, are putting them at the center and keeping families whole and connected. It is a huge um, uh, issue that we are not addressing mm -hmm. as effectively or equitably as we can, um, as well as network partners and fellows like College and Community Fellowship and Reverend Vivian Nixon, who are leaders in this field thinking about from lived experience out to policy change, what are educational connectivity pathways um, throughout the course of lives for families that um, are touched by or involved um, with, the, um, with the criminal justice system. So there are many other innovations. Our website is a plethora where I would go off and I just say, maybe also check out some of the brain science work to the question that someone asked a question about biological mm -hmm. or non-biological. We have seen that both in the brain science and these other practices that Yes, there's, there can be a biological factor, as well as the two generation approach crosses and has effects for non biological and um, as well as biological. And so that's a really important insight I just want to share. So, again, Marta, we can't thank you and the entire team at Child Trends enough um, for the work that you've done and you always do. And Michelle Sarche, beloved Ascend Fellow, for all that you do and lead on. And Marjorie, of course, you as well. And so, Sarah, thank you. Thanks, Anne. So I know we're a minute or two over, so just want to say thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we had, uh, as I said at the top, nearly all 50 states represented in our registration. So to recap, this deck, the recording, and a transcript will be on our website. We will thoroughly go through all the questions, so we make sure that we respond to those who have some nuanced um, data questions and or follow-up questions on a number of resources we've shared. We'll put all of that onto our website. We also want to highlight that we'll be hosting the 2023 Aspen Forum on Children and Families on April 11th and 12th, the theme of which is Taking Action for Family Prosperity. The data you heard today will be woven throughout that forum, along with dynamic sessions with speakers sharing some of their insights on big two gen solutions. So uh, you can go to our homepage and register for that virtual forum. Thank you again. Have a wonderful rest of your Thursday.